evening, church. It is good to see you guys here. It's been a uh, been a week this week, actually, with the school. Uh, it's good to be here, though, in the Lord's house, uh, just to take that time away. Let's go ahead and stand. Let's sing out. Take your spiral hymnals tonight. We're going to look at 185, Saved by the Blood. Great promise, uh, straight from the Word of God. Saved by the Blood. Lift it up with us. 185 in our spirals. Saved by the Blood of the in your spirals for those that just walked in. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, the angels rejoicing because it is done. A child of the Father joins here with the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved, saved. Brother John Marley, if you'd lead us in prayer. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and lift up another song tonight. 144, once again, in our spirals. Sound the battle cry, see the foe is nigh. Marching on. Tonight, 144, let's sing out, sound the battle cry. Sound the battle cry, see the foe is nigh, raise the standard high for the Lord, urge your heart on, stand firm everyone, press your cause upon his holy word, rouse and soldiers rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along, onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna. 
thanks for smiling. <laughs> you can go ahead and be seated at this time. And he is the captain, isn't he? Amen. Captain of our salvation, the scripture says. We're thankful uh, for that. Good to see you tonight in the Lord's house. I want to just remind you ladies, you have a uh, mother-daughter luncheon this Saturday. And I appreciate the work that the ladies have put in uh, to make it special for you. So I'm sure that it's going to be a blessing to you. Uh, if you haven't taken care of the expenses, uh, I'm sure there's somebody around here. Judy, is she'll take care of it. She'll take your money. All right. You, you always notice it's a woman that will take the money. Uh, I've noticed that uh, over the years. So regardless. Well, I see. We, we want to continue for the next week or two uh, working on our faith promise at this point. We're up to about $118,000, so we're still a little short. But uh, I know that there's some folks uh, uh, be coming in Sunday that weren't here. Is there anyone here tonight that uh, wants to take part in Faith Promise? You didn't get a chance to turn it in. Raise your hand. Uh, Pat, if you'll get a card over there. And if you'll just drop it in the offering plate and mark the class that you're going to put it in, I'll see that it goes toward the, the proper class. Okay. There was some confusion, and I, I thought we've done this enough years it shouldn't have been, but the class you turn your offering in, your card in, is the class that you need to put your offering in on Sundays. Uh, so if you promise it, if you put it in the adult class envelope and you go put it in the young at heart, I'm going to miss my goal. If you put it in the young at heart class and then put it in the adult class offering, they're going to miss their goal. And uh, so... Uh, help us with that. Just be aware that each class has a goal based upon what was promised, or they have a budget, I should say, based upon what was promised. So uh, if you haven't turned them in, be sure to do so, and uh, we'll keep you up to date on that. I think uh, there will be a few Sunday, and then we'll see where we are uh, with that. Okay. Uh, I think this time we'll go ahead and receive our gifts and offerings. Uh, trustees that are here, just so you know, uh, on the soccer field that they talked about uh, Sunday, they're supposed to start that Monday. So everything's taken care of that we talked about. So uh, just be aware of that. All right, let's look, look to the Lord in prayer. Brother Pat Scheidler, would you lead us, please? this time I don't have any extra prayer requests to add to the sheet yes sir That was Dave and Penny both. Dave and Penny took them. Right. Any others? Is there anyone who did not get a prayer sheet tonight? 
Hey, we're batting 100. I'd like to read a prayer letter from Mark and Michelle Hale, Hale, Baptist Missionaries to Portugal. March and April 2016. I have new glasses, so if you see me doing this stuff up here, because I'm trying to catch the words. Dear praying friends, it was shaping up to be one of those days. Right from the start, everything seemed to fall apart around me. Car problems, road construction delays, bureaucratic runarounds, and not enough time to get it all done. I had to be up at the church two hours early for the piano tuner to get his job finished before Bible Institute classes began. He assured me it would take no longer than an hour. I should have known better. <laughs> Did anybody ever get up having those kind of days? <laughs> two hours later, he still had the piano in pieces and was not even close to being done. Students had begun arriving, and I knew this day was going to end the way it had unfolded as a disaster. He piled all the pieces together and told me he would return the next day to finish the job. As I laid the last pieces carefully down and turned around to face the class, I was pleasantly surprised. Oh, goody. Three new students were there for the Bible Institute, and we enjoyed one of the best classes we have ever had. With nine students present and another 61 tuning in live via Ustream, we had a total of 70 students from Portugal, Brazil, Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau. We had students from all Portuguese-speaking countries in the world except for Goa, India, Macau, China. The Bible Institute has grown and is now reaching into five countries. Wow. We are humbled and thrilled to see what God is doing to reach this generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for making this possible. Then it has a, I guess it's called an asterisk down here, and it says, We love you folks and thank God for you. Reflecting his light in the world, Mark Hale. Received in February prayers, thank you very much. And received in March. $215. Thank you so much. Now, if we could, we'd like to have a short time of prayer. If you want to pray at the altar, you may come forward, or you can pray in your uh, seat, your pew, and then we'll come back to the prayer letter. Thank you.
our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the mercy that you show us, for the grace that you've given us. We don't deserve it. Father, we thank you most of all for the salvation gift of Jesus Christ. We praise you, Father, for all the wonderful things that you've given us in our life. Father, we thank you for this prayer time that we can come to you and bring these petitions to you. Father, we ask now that you'll be with those who are in the hospitals. Some of them have been there for a while and some are new. You know who they are. I pray, my Father, that your healing hands be upon them. Guide the hands of the doctors and the nurses and the caretakers that they would have a knowledge and a wisdom and a guidance and your hands be upon them. Father, we pray for the Dixon family who's lost their six-month-old cousin. Father, we pray for Gary Simmons' uncle's family that you will give them peace and mercy and comfort. Please be with, uh, yes, you know who it is, Father. We pray for those in the nursing home rehab. And Father, for those who are in need of salvation, there's so many who have been on this prayer list so long. We pray that you would be in their hearts and their minds, that they would Turn to you for salvation. Father in heaven, we have many uh, young men and women who are going out, have joined the military and are in a position to protect us, to protect our shores and our borders. And Father, we pray that you will protect them as they protect us. Please be with the uh, first responders who rush out to minister to anyone who needs to minister. Father, we pray for our law enforcement people that you would protect them from evil. And Father, there are many young people in this area and throughout the United States who want to shoot each other rather than talk. We pray that you'll help them overcome this, Father. And for those who are going about trying to help them get over it we pray that this would work father in heaven we thank you for brother mitchell and his wife for brother rick and joshua brother james father we pray that you'll bless the spanish ministry that it would continue to grow and you'd Bless the ministry of Brother Gonzalez. Please, Father, I pray that you'll be with the King family as they take Ashley to the hospital, that she will be well, Father, that if need be, this baby would come tonight and that she and the baby both would be very well. Father, we pray for those who are away Mary and Larry Anderson on a cruise. Such a blessing for them to be able to do that, and I pray that they would return home safely. Father, now as we continue on with our service, I pray that you'll bless the the words that are brought to the mouth of Brother Mitchell. We pray for the singing, and we pray that you'll bless this church and all who attend it. Be with the kids as they're back in... Uh, number 180 I don't pronounce that right but it's number 180 and I pray for uh, the younger kids that they will learn about Jesus and be blessed thank you so much for all that you give us your blessings be upon this service and we give you praise in Jesus precious name amen All right, as we're getting back in our uh, places, let's go ahead and stand together one more song as we take our hymnals, our spiral hymnals tonight, As the Deer Panteth for the Water. 107 in our spirals, lift it up with us as we sing this chorus. As the Deer, number 107 tonight. Nice. 
song there. Let's go ahead and turn around and get our Bibles at this time as we get ready to hear from Brother Rick. Actually, tonight you're going to be able to be seated because we have several scriptures to go through tonight. So go ahead and be seated uh, for tonight. And, uh, appreciate the opportunity the pastor has given me to uh, preach. And uh, what I would like to, to do is I want to start hopefully just a, a two-week, if not maybe a three-week lesson on living by biblical principles. Living by biblical principles. Now, there are four foundational facts concerning the Christian life. If you'd like, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter number 6 and uh, in that. And uh, we'll talk about these first four before we get into the meat of the message by way of introduction. You see, every Christian is, uh, is a soldier in a war against Satan and his evil forces. In Ephesians chapter 6, very familiar passage of Scripture, starting in verse number 10, it says, Finally, my brethren... My brethren, it's talking about us, we that know Christ as our Lord and personal Savior. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil or the tricks of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. See, as Christians, we are under attack consistently. And we have to understand that every day that we get up, every, uh, with, 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 um, every day that God gives us here on his earth, that we are at war with Satan. And we need to prepare ourselves to be at war. It's a foundational truth uh, that if we're going to live by biblical, biblical principles, then we need to understand uh, these four foundational truths. Number one is this. Every Christian is a soldier in war against Satan. Satan is forces. The number two in Ephesians chapter number five, it lets us know that each day, uh, uh, every day, each of us is either experiencing a triumph or a setback in his or her own spiritual battle. It tells the Ephesians chapter five this says, "Let uh, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them." For it is shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light or made known. For whatsoever doth uh, make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, uh, and Christ shall give uh, thee light. See that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise." To walk circumspectly means what? It means to watch every step that you take. We have to be careful. If we are a soldier and we are out each and every day, then we have to uh, be, uh, uh, keep in mind that there are booby traps or uh, IEDs that are out there that, that the enemy sets up for us to try to trip us up or to try to uh, keep us from our spiritual walk. And it tells us that we need to walk circumspectly, uh, not as fools. Don't walk foolishly around. Because every day we'll either experience a triumph or a setback. It tells us to redeem the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. If I were to ask you today, if I were to walk up to you and say, Hey, what is God's will for your life? What would you say? Do you understand what God's will is for your life? For you personally? See, if we're going to be a Christian soldier, then we need to make sure that we are walking worthy of God. We need to make sure that we understand that we are at war and that we're going to either experience a triumph or a setback uh, in our Christian walk. Then number three, it is God's purpose that we have victory in our, Christian's life, in, in our Christian life. In Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39, we read these words. It says, Nay. In all things, we are more than, who knows what the next word is? Conquerors. What is a conqueror? It's a winner. It's somebody that, 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 that is there. You can't say conquerors without smiling. We're conquerors. We won. The last Super Bowl that was played, Super Bowl 50, my team won. I was happy. Saw a guy today. Wearing a Bronco shirt. I was happy. Even pastor was happy for just a little while. 
Just because Peyton won. Now he hates the Broncos again. And he's not ashamed to tell me so. But we're more than conquerors. God wants us to understand that we're conquerors. Through him that loved us. Think about that. We are on the winning side. We shouldn't walk around going, oh, woe is me. Bless God if he just gives me one more day. No, we're conquerors. We need to walk around like those guys did in high school that just got out of the weight room. Yeah, just lifted weights. What's that? The office is that way. Okay, we're supposed to walk around with confidence. So many Christians walk around with a lack of confidence. We're Christian soldiers. We're experiencing triumph. We are more than conquerors. Then it gives us even better news. This says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Think about that. Nothing can separate us from God's love and care for us. That should give us confidence to be conquerors. If we're going to live by biblical principles, we have to understand these foundational facts that every Christian is a soldier in war against Satan and the forces of evil. That every day we either experience a triumph or a setback in our own spiritual battle. And that it is God's purpose that we have victory in our Christian life. And then number four is this. We can only be victorious Christians as we practice biblical principles. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 through 24, we read this abstain from all appearance of evil. What does it mean to abstain? To stay away. Don't go near it. Don't touch it. You tell a kid, fire, it burns, it hurts. How many times do you have to get burned to understand the fire, that fire hurts? Once. If you're Don, he said three times. He's slow. Okay, in that, usually just once. Just once. It says, abstain from all parents of evil and the very God of peace sanctify, set you apart, holy, all of you. And I pray that God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. If we're going to live by biblical principles, we have to have these foundational facts down. Now, these facts may seem very basic to some Christians. However, our failure to remember any one of these truths is often the cause of our spiritual setbacks that we endure in this life. Since victory comes through pondering, and pondering means to consider and to practice biblical principles, I'd like for us to study the topic of living by biblical principles. Now, tonight, we will begin this mini-series. And we're going to talk tonight about this, Christian standards uh, based on biblical principles. So let's get started. Number one, identifying principles. What is a principle? I thought somebody would do it. I thought somebody would point at Mr. Woods. They didn't do it. Okay? That is a principle. Yes, he's a principle, but he's not the principle I'm talking about. Okay? A principle can be defined as following an unchanging law based on the character of God by which we govern our lives. It's a principle, or it's a fundamental truth. Now, uh, uh, a rule or law has a visible part of a principle. Now, um, let me see. Borrow this. How many of you ever heard, what goes up must come down? Okay. How many believe that if I drop this book, it's going to hover and float? Or something else going to happen? it's going to fall. What is that known as? Gravity. Okay? Gravity. No matter what I do with this book, as long as I live in this atmosphere, it's going to fall. Newton's law of gravity. Now, how many of you can explain to me Newton's law of gravity? An apple. Okay? Yes, he discovered it by having an apple hit him on the head. Okay? It's hard to describe, isn't it? But we all know that gravity works. 
We depend upon gravity. What if you got up tomorrow and there was no gravity? Would you truly be getting up? Or would you just be waking up and floating around? Trying to figure out why you're on your roof. Or ceiling, I guess. But we depend upon that. We depend upon gravity. What goes up must come, must come down. Yet, uh, was not this law established during God's creation? I think it was. Newton didn't discover it. God made it. He just figured it out. Now, do we have to understand the complexities of gravity to know that it works? No, we don't. Now, so why did God establish principles for man to live by? Because God is a God of order. We have to have order in life. It tells us that let all things be done decently in order in 1 Corinthians chapter number 14 and verse 40. Now, turn to Genesis chapter number 1. We see this in, in God's creation. Now, we won't read the whole account of creation, but if you look at verse number 11, it says this. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and fruit yielding uh, and fruit trees yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth and it was so and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after its kind and trees yielding fruit those seeds which were in itself after his kind and God saw it and it was good how many of you when you guys go to banana tree expect to get a tangerine you don't why because God's a God of order he made banana trees to produce bananas. He made tangerine trees to produce tangerines. Okay? You see what it is? God is a God of order. If you look at the planets and the way that he aligned them and where he put the earth, if you study science at all, you'll notice that God is a God of order. He expects us to follow order in our lives. That's why he gave us principles. Number two reason is this. He wanted to eliminate sin from our lives this is why he gave us principles or laws to follow by. Now God established the principle of holiness. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, it says this, but as he has but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, in all manner of lifestyle. In everything that you do, we are to be, to be holy. Why? Because it is written. Be ye holy, say it with me, for I am holy. He has set a precedent for us. He has set an order for us to live by. He wants us to strive to have holy lives. Now, God made a way, a way for man, a sinful man, uh, to live a holy life. It tells us in uh, John chapter uh, 3, verses 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. How do we get saved? Is it through Muhammad? Is it by doing good deeds? Is it by giving money to faith promise? Is it by wearing suits? It's through what? Jesus Christ. There's an order. Had somebody tell me yesterday, First time this ever happened. I gave a guy a track. He gave me back a Mormon track. Then he came by and he said, thank you for being so kind to me. I was like, ah, no problem. He says, all of us are serving the same God. I was like, didn't feel like getting in an argument with him in the middle of BMV. But we're not. Because... The way that Joseph Smith tells them they can get to heaven and the way Jesus Christ says that you can get to heaven are two totally different things. God is a God of order. He sent his son to die for sinful man. Tells us in Romans chapter 5 verse 8, but God commendeth or demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Somebody had to pay for our sins. Tells us in Romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 6, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace and where we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed 
because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And we're the ungodly. We're the ones that needed him to die for us. Tells us how we can get saved. Says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not hope so, not maybe, not multiple times, but if we call upon the Lord. God wants us, he's a God of order, to follow his order. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, it tells us this, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and that ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Anybody know what the last three words are? Which are God's. This belongs to God, my whole being. Once I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior, I am not myself anymore. My body becomes his temple. Everywhere I go, he goes. Every thought that I have, he knows. Everything that I say, he hears. Everything that I see, he sees. Because I am his temple. Because I asked him, I invited him in. God wants me to eliminate sin from my life. Therefore, he has given me principles that I must live by so that I can eliminate sin out of my life. But also, not only does he want, to, is, is he a God of order and he wants to eliminate sin from my life, but he wants to know, to let me know why we do what we do. Now, it's important for us to not only learn what we are to do, but more importantly, we need to know why we are doing it. Aren't you glad that we have a God that just doesn't say, because I'm God, that's why. How many of us as parents have, have, have done that to our kids? Because I'm dad, that's why, Brent said. And the kid said, but why, dad? And he didn't take the time to explain it, but God explains to us why. He wants us to live by the principles that he has set for us. And I'm glad that he has given us the answer for those things. Let's just look at an example. Why should you attend church regularly? You ever thought about that? You ever got your kids up for church and said, come on kids, it's time to go to church. And they stopped and said, why? My dad says when I was in fourth grade, got me up for church one day to send me on the church bus. He said that I told him, I don't want to go. I want to be like you. Because I didn't understand why I had to go to church, but he got to stay home. And he couldn't explain it. So he ended up going to church. We lived in Hawaii. Our church didn't have windows. It had a wall that came up to about here, and the peak, the roof came over that way, and there were just, there were no windows. Our baptistry was, I thought it was a pool, because it was outside, but it was the baptistry didn't understand why we didn't use the cool river that was right behind our church. I got to live in Hawaii, second, third, and fourth grade. It was great. But it still couldn't tell me why I was supposed to go to church. But later on in life, I I found this. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised... Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as ye see the day approaching. How many of y'all enjoy coming to church? Be honest. I do. You know why? Because you're here. You're my brothers and sisters in Christ. Pastor said it before, I'm closer to a lot of you than I am to my own family. Not just because of distance, but just because we share the same beliefs. 
I'm in this building six, sometimes seven days a week. It's not the same when you're not here. I was in the auditorium earlier today. It was just me. It's kind of boring. Didn't have anybody smiling at me. Didn't have anybody fanning. Are you guys hot? I'm not. But it's not the same. But I enjoy getting to go shake people's hands. I enjoy getting to talk to folks and to get, getting to see you. Why? Because you're my brothers and sisters in Christ. You know what you're doing? You're provoking me. Now, oftentimes when we think about a brother or sister provoking us, it's not a good thing. You know what I mean? Have you guys had brothers and sisters that used to provoke you? Oh, I had a sister. Mm. Actually, I have four of them, but boy, the one just younger than me. Oh, ho, ho. she knew how to get under my skin. I'm going to let you on a little secret, but if you ever say it, I'm going to punch you right in the mouth. No, I'm just kidding. Whenever she wanted to get under my skin, and I don't know why it did, but she would look at me, and she'd, if she ever got her way, she'd look at me, and she'd go, I hate you. I wanted to choke her. Just that look that she got on her face, that little thing, and then she'd go, you can't touch me. You'll get in trouble by dad because you're not supposed to hit girls. I never wished she was a brother more in my entire life. Probably couldn't get away with that either because then I would have been the older brother and, you know, touch a little brother and sisters. I'm not bitter. I'm better. But we're here to provoke one another. To what? How, what are we supposed to provoke each other to? What's it says right there? Unto love and what? Good works. We're supposed to work together. I'm glad that there are people that are here tonight that are working together. Brother James and, and the youth group have 180 and they're out in the field and pretty soon they'll be in class. There are people taking care of king kids. We're all working together. We all came to the same place to be able to teach people about the word of God. We're provoking one another. We're helping one another. It's an encouragement for that. It's because we do that. It's because we love one another. Why should we assemble every time the doors are open? What is the principle applied here? Christians are supposed to go to church. I remember witnessing to uh, my lieutenant commander. And she said she knew Christ as her Lord and personal Savior. I said, well, what church do you go to? She goes, I don't. I just stay at home. I can worship God at home just as well as I can any church. I could never understand that. I liked going to church. I liked learning uh, 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 new things about God. Well, then when I found out why I'm supposed to, because Christians are supposed to go to church. What is the basis of the principle? Not to forsake. That word forsake means to leave behind or desert our place in attending church because we need the teaching and we need the fellowship. We need the encouragement. I got one text. Actually, my wife did. When Nathaniel handed me her phone, I was able to stand up and share it with all of you. It's a whole lot better than just me praying for Ashley to have all of you pray for Ashley. We're provoking to love and good works. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, if we know what a principle is, it's the law of God that we need to follow by, then how do we establish standards in our life? What is a standard? Well, let me show you. If you're to look up in the dictionary, you get several different things about standards. The first one is this. Sorry. It says, it is a flag or banner with an emblem of a military unit. Which one is this? Navy. Right? Navy. Everybody likes the Navy. All right? Especially Army guys. Okay? And uh, in that. All right? Number two, something established as a rule or basis for measuring uh, uh, quality and quantity. What is this? It's a yardstick. What's it used for? How many of you guys ever got spanked with one of these? Okay. It's a weapon of mass destruction. Okay. Now, what if I was to say, you know what? Uh, I need something cut about a foot. I think a foot's about like this. 
I'm going by my standard. Do you think I'm wrong? Yeah? Because the foot is right, right here. From my hand to my chin. We have to have something that is a standard. Something that we measure by. If we're going to measure. That's what it says. It also says this about a standard. It says that it's an upright support. Aren't you glad that these upright supports that we have all the way around us are keeping the roof from falling in on our head? In order for those to be standing right, there has to be a good and sure foundation underneath them. I've been coming to church here for 22 years. Never been hit by the roof yet. Somebody did a great job at making sure that the standards were in place. But the standard I'm talking about means this. Ideas about moral conduct and acceptable behavior. Moral, correct, or acceptable behavior. One of the most important verses in the Bible for a Christian uh, who uh, is about to establish standards in their life is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. And it says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know what that word steadfast means? It means firmly fixed. It'd be like me sitting down saying, you can't move me. Now, I could probably say that to Miss Parton and Miss Nancy back there. They'd just get the yardstick and beat me. I know what they would do. They're mature, experienced mothers. I'd have a hard time saying that to Brother Billy. I just get up as soon as he started walking this way. But it means firmly fixed is what it means. We're supposed to be firmly fixed. Steadfast. We're supposed to be unmovable. The word unmovable obscure here means to have a sure foundation. Always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain. There was not a card that I ever received that I can ever remember receiving from my grandma, mister, that did not have this verse right next to her name. She wanted to make sure that I understood this verse for all my life. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, verse 15 and verse 19. I want to read these verses to you and then we'll stop for here for tonight. It says this, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Brother Billy, was the army easy? Did you endure some hardships, brother? Any other army men in here? Was being a tanker just a breeze? but was it a breeze? No. See, they have these things when you go in the military, they're called boot camp. Don't tell Austin, he has no idea. You have no personal space. And I don't think they ever brush their teeth when they come to talk to you. But you know what they're doing while they're in boot camp? They're trying to build you into the soldier or the sailor or the Marine, or the airman that they want you to be. How about you military wives? Is living the military life easy? Uh-uh. Did you endure some hardships along the way? Sure you did. Sure you did. 
It broke my heart when I got back and found out that when I was in Desert Storm, that Tanya would watch the news to see what was going on. Hoping, but not hoping to see me. One time when I was deployed, there was a terrible helicopter accident on a ship serving real close to us. First thing her mom did was call and say, Rick's name isn't on the list because I was with a Hilo born uh, marine company. We flew a lot of places. First time I ever got in a CH-46, it crash landed. That made me real excited about getting in helicopters after that. But there's a lot of hardships that are out there. You know what, living the Christian life, there's a lot of hardships. There's a lot of things that you have to endure. But what did Paul's instruction to us say? That we can endure hardness as a what? A good soldier of Jesus Christ. What's one of our foundational principles? That every day we have to realize that we are in a fight as a Christian soldier. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It tells that same chapter, verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So let me ask you some questions. When establishing a standard... We need to remember who we're fighting for. Who are we fighting for? The Lord. We're fighting for the Lord. We're fighting for God. He is our captain. We sang about it tonight. Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Aren't you glad? We were just talking about, about the millennium in, 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 in class. I, uh, I was telling the students, I said, you know what? When we come back, we're going to be all decked out, riding our own horse, and we're not going to have to do anything but just sit there and watch. Christ is going to win the battle all on his own. Isn't that cool? I just think that's awesome. I'm on the victorious side. Think about it. So when I'm establishing standards for my life, when I'm looking at what type of conduct, what type of behavior I'm going to have, I need to understand that I'm here to please God. And can I tell you that if I'm pleasing God, that there's a trickle-down effect that goes with that? If I'm pleasing God, then I should be pleasing to my God-fearing wife. Just goes to show you. And then if I'm pleasing my wife and I'm pleasing God and my wife, then I should be pleasing to my kids. Now, I may, they may not always be pleasurable with the decisions and stuff I make, but eh, for the most part, they'll like me. Right now, I have all adult kids by age. By age. <laughs> Can I get an amen for some of you other parents? Oh, yeah, by age. My youngest doesn't like being called an adult. That's all she ever wanted. Now that she is an adult, she don't want to be one. Too many decisions. Too much responsibility. That and she doesn't like that her license now is going to go from vertical to horizontal. She don't like it. So too bad. You're an adult. But we're supposed to be pleasing to God. When establishing a standard, we need to remember what we're fighting for. What are we fighting for? We're fighting for the righteousness of God. We're fighting for what is right. Do you realize that the Bible tells us in Matthew that we are the law, we are the light and the salt and the light of this earth? And do you realize that when, when the rapture happens and we're gone, the world will be without us and there'll be no more salt to preserve, there'll be no more light? other than what God gives to them? 
because we'll be gone. And while we were here, people expect Christians to act like Christians. They expect us to be different. They want us to be different. Even if they won't say it <coughs> out loud, there's a certain behavior that they expect from us. When establishing us a standard, we need to remember where you are receiving your instructions. Where do we re receive our instructions from? Sorry. God's Word, the Bible. It says so. It tells us wh what we're supposed to do, to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that need not to be shamed. How are we supposed to divide the Word of Truth? Rightly. We're supposed to study it till we understand it. If we don't understand it, ask somebody a question. There's nothing wrong with questions. But we need to have those standards, and they need to be based upon God's Word. When establishing a standard, we need to remember where uh, to determine your stand. What did it tell us in verse number 19? It says, And everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Where do we draw the line in the sand? Can't make it in. Sin! We're to depart from all iniquity. Verses that we read earlier said that we're not even supposed to talk about these things that are done in secret. We're supposed to be set apart. We're supposed to be different. The Bible calls us peculiar people. Now let me tell you something. You want to find some peculiar people? Go down to junior high hall. Junior hires are very peculiar. And I asked Miss Tina today, and, and Brother Woods, I'll ask you too, can we please put a, a Febreze, uh, a mister, like they have at the uh, at music parks with a little water that comes through, right there where the kids come in from recess. Man, one of the classes came in from recess, and I have a deviated septum, the doctor tells me, so I can't smell a whole lot of things. I had no problem smelling them. And it wasn't pleasant, was it? <laughs> if somebody could come up with that, I'd be happy to, to put in some money for it. <laughs> I, I looked at the teacher and said, can you please freeze your, freeze your class before you bring them in? Whew. And then these poor teachers have to march them back to class and then shut the door. It's horrible. I don't know how I got off on that. Where was I? Oh, yes. We're supposed to depart from all iniquity. In other words, there is supposed to be a line drawn in the sand where we are not supposed to cross. There are things that we're supposed to say no to. Christians are supposed to be different. If we're going to live by biblical principles, we need to set standards in our life that, that tell people that we are different. They should be able to tell it by the character of the people that we are. By the way that we act and react in different situations. And be able to admit when we do something wrong. They want us to be different. We have to be different because that's what God wants us to be. If we're going to live by the principles of God, if we're going to live by the fundamental truths of holiness then we have to be different. We have to be different. Next week we'll pick up and talking about how we can maintain our standards once we've set them. It's so vitally important for us to understand this. Then we'll get into three of the biggest principles that God wants us to know, to live by. But can I just tell you, the Bible says as you see the day approaching, can I tell you, we're nearer to Christ coming back than we've ever been. I honestly believe, I, I honestly believe he's going to come back in my lifetime. I really do. I'm looking for him. When we were talking about the rapture, I said, hey, let's have rapture practice. Figured maybe if I jump, I'd get a little bit ahead. But you know what? We're supposed to be looking for the day of his coming. I don't know about you guys, but I looked forward to July 16th, 1983. You know what day that was? 
Yep, the day I got married, I looked forward to it. I wasn't dreading it. It wasn't like, oh, no, I'm having an old ball and chain. Nobody with me the whole time. I was excited. I was looking forward to it. I was looking forward to the day my wife said, it's time. Time for what? The baby's coming. I was excited. March 22nd, 1985. Didn't know whether it was a boy or girl. Didn't care. But she arrived. And three more times, I got to look forward to her date. I wasn't looking too forward to June 29th because I knew 22 steps from that back door to right here was all I was going to have left with Crystal Amber Renee Salazar because there was some creepy kid standing there that wanted to make her Crystal Amber Renee Corlew. I love my son-in-law to death. But boy, I sure did love my daughter. We have something to look forward to. We're a soldier. We fight every day. I'm hoping that we have more triumphs than we have setbacks. But just because we have a setback, don't let it be a stumbling block. Make it a stepping stone. Because God wants us to live victorious lives. Yea, we are more than conquerors. We're on the winning side. We're on the winning side. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please. God has established for us principles to live by. God expects us to establish standards in our life to live by. Tonight, Just think about it. Are you set? Do you have your standards? Do you know why you do what you do? Are you living the way God wants you to live? Can you say and sing honestly the song that we're getting ready to sing, Take My Life and Let It Be, Consecrated Lord to Thee? Think about it. Father, we thank you, Lord, for... Uh, your love. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We just pray, God, you'd be with this time of invitation. Lord, I pray, God, that we would have lives. Lord, that my life would be consecrated solely to you. Lord, that I would be the light and the salt that you want me to be in this world. That the standards that I have set for my life would be worthy of the holiness that you want me to live by. Lord, just pray that you'd be with our time of invitation. We ask your precious name. Amen. If you need the words, they're found on page 376 in a regular hymn book, Take My Life and Let It Be. sure that you're in prayer uh, for uh, Sunday services. And then don't forget, if you need uh, a card for uh, Faith Promise, then uh, please fill that out. And if you have not, and uh, I'd like to see us make our goal and uh, this weekend so that we can pick up some more missionaries and do the work that God has called us to do uh, around the world. Had a great missions conference, wonderful messages, and uh, probably some of the best messages that I've ever heard in a missions conference. So now it's time for us to do our part and uh, in making sure that uh, uh, we financially support all that, uh, that God has laid on pastor's heart for us to support. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. And uh, Brother Woods, if you would, please, would you dismiss a word of prayer?